Greg Williams, who is the GCI Church Administration and Development Director, uh, he came out with a statement in the January 2016 edition of Equiper that reads like this. With confidence in God and reliance on His faithfulness, I am pleased to announce that Year of Renewal is the GCI USA theme for 2016. As you turn your calendars forward, I encourage you to focus on this theme by prayerfully considering how Jesus, through the Spirit, will be working in the year ahead to bring renewal to your life, your ministry, and your congregation. So today, we start on the topic, the series on renewal. And we'd like to understand what renewal is. Okay. And this morning, I was just uh, meditating on this message and talking to God about this. And looking back on the ministry of Jesus Christ with the disciples for three and a half years, you know, they were following Jesus. They became disciples of Jesus because they, they, they wanted to follow Him. And one of those disciples is named Mary Magdalene. Now, just imagine this. Back in the New Testament times, during the time of Jesus, women didn't have this equal opportunity that men had, that we have now, right? Now, we don't totally have equal opportunity for women yet. They're still complaining about the, the salary level of women compared to men, right? Uh, doing the same jobs. But back then, they didn't have the opportunity for education like men had. They were considered property. And, you know, they were not supposed to talk to men out there on the road. They could talk to their husbands in private, but not, you know, but not out there on the road. And one of them, one of the disciples was Mary Magdalene. In fact, many of them, this was radical for Jesus to do because he accepted women as disciples. We just don't know it, but in his entourage, he had women come with him on his trips. That's very unusual for a man or a rabbi or a teacher during his time. But he was radical. If you wanted to know what radical means, just look at Jesus. His life was totally radical. One of them was Mary Magdalene. We're going to focus on Mary's um, encounter with Jesus at the resurrection. And we're going to do this three Sundays before Easter simply because we want to find out what renewal is like. And if you look at the, um, the three and a half years that Jesus went through, He had disciples follow Him. Men, women, and probably even younger children, children, uh, teenagers, we don't know that much. But we do know that he had an entourage of people following him. In fact, he had an entourage of people who were also supporting his ministry. And even women who supported his ministry. So, they went through a change in their lives. Because, like Jesus said to one of someone who came to him and said, I want to follow you. And he said, birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So this is a radical uh, discipleship kind of thing that you want to go um, become a disciple of me because I'm not going to be like all the other teachers. I'm not like them. These teachers, they expect you to come and sit with them, I expect you to go with me. In fact, when some of the disciples first found Jesus, they said, Hey teacher, where do you live? And instead of giving them the number and the street and the district or the county that he lived in, he said, come follow me. So he showed them where he lived. A very radical way of teaching. Mary Magdalene if you do a study on Mary Magdalene, she was delivered or exercised of seven demons. Now we get confused about Mary because there are three different Marys in the Gospels. There's Mary Magdalene, there's Mary the mother of Jesus, and there's Mary 
the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Now, Mary Magdalene is not Mary, the sister of Martha, and she's definitely not the Ma Mary, the mother of Jesus. But she had she had seven demons cast out of her, and she had a very, very close relationship with Jesus. In fact, of all the disciples in the Gospels, she was mentioned more times than most of the disciples. Think about that for a while. Her name was mentioned more times than most of the disciples in the Gospels. Probably not more than Peter or John, but his, her name was mentioned a lot more times than all the other disciples. She's a woman. And that's unheard of in during the time when the Gospels were written. In fact, one of the one of the witnesses at the resurrection was Mary Magdalene. And for them to actually write about a woman as a witness is unheard of because women were not considered um, reliable witnesses. Oh, you can understand because of the culture, women were not included as part of the reliable witnesses. So if you had two witnesses, you would have two male witnesses. I'm sorry about that, but you know, that's the reality back then. Thankfully, it's no longer the reality now. Now, let, let's go to John chapter 20, verses 11 to 18. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look inside the tomb. <coughs> and she saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? And she answered, They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. See, Jesus had died, they had put his body inside the tomb, they closed the tomb, sealed it, and then suddenly something happened that early morning, and an angel came, or angels came, and moved the stone, and Jesus came out. And so, his body was no longer found, and that was a big um, controversy and a big issue among the leaders of Israel. Verse 14, At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Now, this is a story looking back. Now, she didn't know it was Jesus. She just turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Now, think about it. She had been with Jesus for how long? Maybe three years, maximum three and a half years, maybe a year, we don't know. We just know that she had been with the disciples in that entourage and she was following Jesus. Okay? Now, if you were following, I'd like to make fun of Hershel. If you were following Hershel for one year, would you know how his voice sounds like? Can you tell without looking at him, you know, if he was speaking or not? Yeah, he could just call you on the phone and you know it's Hershel, right? Now, if, you were, if, if he was at a distance walking, can you tell if it was him or someone else? Yeah, you kind of know how he walks, right? And you can tell if, by the way he dresses that it's Hershel, right? It's not going to be Frank and it's not William, definitely, right? <laughs> definitely not, not Frank because different color. So at this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Verse 15, he asked her, Jesus asked her, woman. So instead of calling her by her name, she said, he says, woman, why are you crying? It's like someone who doesn't know her says, 
woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Pretending as if he didn't know, right? And thinking he was the gardener, Mary said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. As if she could carry him by, by herself. <laughs> but she, she's this kind of dedicated woman. She was so dedicated, she was willing to go out of her way and pick him up herself and bring, her, bring him back to the tomb. I'm kidding. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, that one word, just like that, Mary was Jesus. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, or which means teacher. Teacher! You know, there is no one else who would accept me as a teacher because I am a woman. And yet you accepted me as your own disciple. There is no other teacher who would accept me as a disciple. You accepted me. There's no one like you. And when he said Mary, that tone, and the way it was expressed, she knew that was Jesus. Or any every other way that you can hear people call your name, like like my brother, my sisters would call me Ruel, but they express it in a different way. So I, you know, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> you know, someone can call you by your name, and you know you're in trouble, right? But Mary knew that when Jesus calls her, it's, a, it's an expression of an endearment, of love, of compassion, of care. That he doesn't care whether you have seven demons or seven hundred demons cast out of you. He doesn't care. He just loves you for who you are in Christ. He just loves you for how the Father looks at you. He loves you so much that, you know, He doesn't care where you've been, what you've been through, and how long it took you to change, and what you're going through right now, and what you're going to go through in the future. He doesn't care how long it will take you to become perfect, because right now, you are already perfect, although, although you're not perfect. Right? How many of you know that you're not perfect? And yet God loves you. And yet God, through Jesus Christ, gave His life for you. And someone can call us by our names and you can feel the condemnation. The judgment. The hatred. And yet Jesus can call you by your name. And you can just feel that tenderness, the kindness, compassion. Verse 17, Jesus said, Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. See, Mary probably grabbed a hold of him and embraced him, you know. How someone that you thought was dead suddenly is alive, what would you do? You just run towards that person and just hug him and, and you kiss him all over and say, oh, you're alive! But Jesus said, oh, oh, don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but I'm sending you on a mission. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. Now for the first time in their lives, Mary hears Jesus say, My Father and your Father. We have the same Father now. It's because I came out of that tomb that now we have the same Father. Before it was my Father, but now because of what I've done on the cross, and what I have done through the resurrection. We now have the same Father. My Father and your Father. To my God and your God. 
verse 18. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news and probably she was running and tripping over herself trying to get to the disciples and saying, Hey, here's the good news. I have seen the Lord. And the disciples probably said, You must be crazy. <laughs> Seriously, woman? I saw him die. He was on the cross. I was there at the foot of the cross. John probably said, I was there. They pierced him on the right side. He died. He gave up the ghost. We took them to the tomb. We took him to the tomb. Joseph's tomb. We put him in there. And he's been there for three days. Mary said, I have seen the Lord. You can't believe me. I have seen the Lord. Now, think about this. Jesus chose, or God chose, a woman to be the first bearer of good news. To be the witness. Now, why didn't he choose Peter? Why didn't he choose John, the beloved? Why didn't he choose James? I mean, he could have chosen any one of the men. There were 12 of them, right? And yet, his choice was not a man, but a woman. Now, man, look at the women here. God chose a woman. See, the men can't even look. <laughs> They're so ashamed of themselves. God chose a woman. You feel like you've been crushed and, and treaded upon and abused. God doesn't think that way. He's for you. He loves you. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So she related what Jesus told her so that she could pass on that information to them. Think about it. The first missionary was a woman. And her mission was the apostles. What? The disciples was the first mission? I thought they were with Jesus for three and a half years. But you see, discipleship is about laying down your life. Discipleship is about dying to yourself. Dying to your ambitions, dying to your reputation, dying to everything that you want, leaving everything behind, leaving the comfort of your home. That's discipleship. Saying no to the things that you want, and saying yes to the things that God wants for you. That's discipleship. And yet they had to go down to the very depths of despair and discouragement and depression. Seeing their Messiah, Jesus, the King, they thought He would be the King. Then seeing Him crucified and all hope lost. They were so depressed, they went back home. What are we going to do now? Two of them went over to Emmaus. As they were walking, their heads were down. They didn't know what just happened. They couldn't make sense of God sending the Messiah, the Messiah being killed, and now three days in the tomb. It just didn't make sense. So God had to bring them to the place where they were so desperate, so discouraged, so depressed, before God could use them. Sometimes God brings that, us to that very place, the very end of our rope, before God can use us. See, if you're going that way, if you think that all hope is lost, you're in the best place of all. That's the place God wants you to be so that you can see Him Break it into the darkness and be the light. 
He wants you in that tomb, in that dark tomb, so that He can roll that stone, that heavy stone, and bathe you with the light of Jesus Christ. So if you're not at the end of the road yet, guess what? Here's the thing. <clears throat> Renewal doesn't just come. Not through programs, not through anything that we're going to do in the church. Renewal, just like a seed that has dropped to the ground, that has to die first before it will sprout and become a new plant. You have to come down to the deepest part of your life. It starts with a deep, very personal, very intimate, and a truly life-changing encounter with Jesus. That's where a new world begins. I know that's hard. And I'm sure some of you have gone through that, are going through that, will go through that. I've gone through four already. And I'm sure there's more. Just remember, it's that encounter with Jesus. That time there, when you think all hope is lost, when you go inside the tomb and find that there's no body inside that tomb, when you think someone else has stolen the life out of you, that's when Jesus breaks in and says, here I am. And he calls you by your first name. With a voice that's so tender, so compassionate, so loving, with that deep, personal, intimate, life-changing encounter with Jesus. That's where we find our renewal.